When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Welcome to you all to our Pentecost service. Our prayer is that your hearts would be warmed by the Father's love and touched by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on this Pentecost Sunday we praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, whose ministries are as multiple as they are magnificent. Though invisible, the evidence of his work is everywhere. It is only by your Spirit that we even believe the Gospel. He convicted us of our sins, gave us eyes to see Jesus and faith to trust him. And indeed, by the Spirit we are born again and are no longer dead in our sins and trespasses. And Father, we praise you for the new birth and the new life in Jesus. And yet there is so much more for which we are to be grateful. By the Spirit, you sealed us forever as your beloved people. He is the first fruits of our final redemption, the guarantee that one day we will live with the whole family of God in the new heaven and the new earth. He's the wedding ring wrapped around our hearts, the sign and the security of our betrothal to Jesus, our loving bridegroom. And it's by the Spirit that we hear you telling us that we are your beloved children, guiltless and condemnation-free. Through the Spirit, we learn more of the glory and the grace of Jesus, for he's constantly drawing attention to our Savior. And by the Spirit's power, we're enabled to put to death everything in us that contradicts the, doc the gospel. Oh, the peace that we have, knowing the Spirit is making us more and more like Jesus, for it wouldn't happen otherwise. And we can pray and worship you acceptably, Father, only through the Spirit. And we're comforted to know that he ceaselessly prays inside of us, even though we're too distracted or too broken to pray. And through the Spirit, you've gifted us for service and empowered us for mission. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And Father, on this Pentecost Sunday, we hear afresh your command that we are to be filled with the Spirit. So may it be to your glory and our growth. But we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. For your forgiveness when we forget 
that the power lies within and trust instead on our own human strength. Remind us of that glorious day when your spirit transformed the lives who were waiting, those who were gathered in that room, and transformed them into men of power. Renew the hearts which have grown cold with flames of your holy fire, as on that Pentecost, that we might be the church that you desire. And as we gather today, as your body, as your church throughout this world, Fill our outstretched hearts with your spirit. Encircle us with your love. Make yourself known to us in new ways, in, an ex in exciting ways, in challenging ways. Empower us and inspire us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' exalted and loving name we pray. Amen. Readings this morning are taken from John chapter 14, verse 15 to 21, and Acts chapter 1, verse 3 through to verse 9. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. We all know about the agony of waiting. You know, waiting for the results from our exams, waiting to see the doctor or dentist while we sit in absolute agony, waiting for the next series of our favorite TV show because the last one ended on such a cliffhanger and you just have to know what's going to happen. Waiting in the queue at supermarkets, you know, keeping our social distance and hiding behind our masks. Waiting for the president to address the nation on the actions of the, the government is going to take next amidst the global pandemic. And then waiting for the next level of lockdown to be implemented so that we have that little bit more freedom. Sure, waiting can be frustrating. And mostly we feel it's empty space. You know, it's dead time, it's fruitless, it's a frustrating nothing that we have to endure between happenings. The less we have to wait, the happier we are. But can you imagine the feelings of the followers of Jesus? They had seen the enemies of the Lord take him and crucify him, and they were devastated by the defeat. They had pinned all their hopes on his messiahship, only to see him overwhelmed by his opposition and killed. But then, in a startling act of God, Jesus was raised from the dead, and the disciples were both terrified and overjoyed. And for 40 days, the risen Christ strengthened their faith, restored their hope, and taught them his truth. Can you any, imagine anything more, more thrilling or more or inspiring? Those followers who had fled from the cross were now ready to charge into the world. They were filled with urgency, and you can hear it in the question that they asked Jesus. Lord, is now the time that you're going to bring the kingdom of God and restore Israel to the glory not known before? We're ready, Lord. We're ready. But Jesus answered, that's God's business. You just need to find a nice room in Jerusalem where you can wait for the gift my father has promised. It's the gift that the prophet Joel had written about. It's the gift proclaimed by John the Baptist, the gift that Jesus himself had spoken on about on numerous occasions and anticipated after his resurrection. Wait, surely you don't want to lo us to lose our momentum, Lord? You heard me, Jesus said. Go and wait. Why? Not for nothing, that's for sure. 
Because Jesus continued, so you can receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And then he was taken up before their very eyes, as the writer of Acts recalls. Waiting for power. Unseen, intangible, divine power. Did they really need to do that? And do we? Couldn't they just carry on with the strength and the gusto that they had for the 40 days while the resurrected Jesus appeared to them? Why did they have to wait for this Pentecostal power of God? Isn't a good plan and a little determination enough? Well, evidently Jesus didn't think so. Go and wait, he said. The problem was, and even though they heard Jesus' words, they still didn't know what to expect. It was not enough that they were waiting for a, a date on a calendar or at the arrival of a package of a certain description. They were waiting for power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. That wasn't something they could look out the window for and see coming down the road or track its progress with the tracking number. It was an unknown. It was a mystery. But they obediently waited. And Luke gives us a hint of what they did while they were waiting when he wrote in Luke chapter 24, verse 52 and 53. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. That's after Jesus ascended. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. And then finally, something happened. When on the day of the Feast of Pentecost they were gathered in that room, suddenly there was a sound like a violent wind blowing through the room. And something like flickering tongues of fire appeared and alighted each of the disciples. They opened their mouths and began to speak, not as they normally did, but as God enabled them to speak, in a language people of all the nations could hear and understand. And Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, preaching the first message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after he had finished talking, those who accepted the message were baptized, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. The church was born. All because their disciples obeyed and waited. They waited for the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't be Jesus' witnesses without the Holy Spirit. It's like a car salesman needs a car to show you. You know, he can explain to you for hours and hours you know, all the specs and the colors and the trim versions and things. But unless you physically see a physical car, it means nothing. And it's the same with us. Without the Holy Spirit, we can talk about Jesus and who he is and what he's done as much as we want to to others. But until there is actual vi visual evidence of a Holy Spirit controlled life, it's all going to be in vain. Only the Holy Spirit can make Christians witnesses. As we see, saw in verse 8, when Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Not go and witness in the meantime, and in the near future the Holy Spirit will come upon you. But who is this Holy Spirit that the disciples were told to wait for? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. In the Bible, we see God the Father, the creating, the brooding, strong God. And if you read only the Old Testament, you would be a little frightened because the God of the Old Testament is the God of vengeance, the God of law. God the Father in the Old Testament is Ruach, the Spirit of God, the breath of God, which comes and leaves. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon them said the prophets. You see that throughout the Old Testament. That is God the Father. And in the New Testament, specifically in the Gospels, we see that we see God the Son. And what did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the Father and I are one. The Old Testament shows us that God is distant and unapproachable. But in the Gospels, we see God as very approachable moving among us, showing us what God would be like if we could sit down and know him, which we can. And that is the message that Jesus brought, God the Son. 
and then starting in the book of Acts from Pentecost through to Revelation, we see God, the Holy Spirit, the energizing power of God among the people. Pentecost is important to us to understand and to celebrate. Yes, we've had Easter and the death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, but God needed to do something more. Not more for our salvation, but more for his purposes in the world. So for 40 days, Jesus was with his disciples. And then they went to the Mount of Olives and he ascended to his father. And 10 days later at the Feast of Pentecost, when there were people from all over the world in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, he came back as the Spirit of God. Peter preached to the people who had come from all over the world. They heard the message in their own languages and 3,000 people were saved. And the church was born that day at Pentecost. Our church and all churches need Pentecost in order to be complete. But what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, first of all, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit in different translations in, of John chapter 14, verse 16, the, the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, the helper. And each of these words means similar thing. The Holy Spirit is the one who is there for us. The Holy Spirit is God, is of God, and does the work of God. And part of that work is to bring comfort and counsel and being the advocate and the helper to those who are in Christ. But not only does the Holy Spirit comfort and counsel and be the advocate and help us, but the Spirit of God also converts. We don't convert anybody. I would like to think that God called me to convert people, but he didn't, and I don't. He called me to speak his word, and I have to trust that his word converts, that his word strikes in the human heart, and that his word carries its own power. When you're saved, when God changes your life, it is the message of God, the ministry of God that does it. It's not the ministry of the preacher but the ministry of God working through the preacher that actually makes it happen. We're just the vehicles. It is God through his Holy Spirit that does that converting. And he also convicts us of our sin. We know from the law that doing certain things is wrong. But it's only when the Holy Spirit convicts us of those wrongful things that we become sorrowful and ask for forgiveness. And we know this from the New Testament, that the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in bringing the sinner to conviction over their sin. Because Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And, he, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus makes it clear that it would be the work of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of their sin, which is necessary if anyone is to be saved. But how does he do this? He does it through the gospel. Peter says in his first letter, chapter, 12, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, that the apostles have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The gospel is a powerful message. And it's the message that God the Spirit uses to bring people to salvation. And then Peter continues in verse 22 and 23 of chapter 1. Since you have, been purified your, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Spirit, through his word, has given us the ability to be born again by the power of God. We obeyed the truth and we were born again through the work of the Holy Spirit. He uses his words to convict. But the Holy Spirit also gives guidance. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus tells his disciples, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I've said to you. 
But then in chapter 16, he says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit, through his guidance, leads us and teaches us the truths of God's word. And the Holy Spirit is also the mediator between you and God. As, Ro as Romans chapter 8 verse 26 tells us, the Holy Spirit right now is at the throne of grace, talking to God, calling our names before God, interceding for us. The Holy Spirit also brings joy, not joy from seeing puppies or kittens or from having a good time, but real joy. And this real joy is knowing that within you there is a sense that you can rejoice even when the wind is blowing in your face. That is something God gives you through the power of the Holy Spirit. If there is no joy in your life, no real joy at all, I guarantee you that you're not in step with God. But what does the Holy Spirit not do? Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't send religious ecstasy for the sake of religious ecstasy. We don't go running around looking for God, trying to find where he next will be so that we can get the next zap from him. God is not in that kind of business. And people who are doing this are making a perversion of the gospel by making salvation of a collection of religious experiences in the same way that you would harvest avos or macadamias. God gives religious experiences so that we may be energized to do his work. You couldn't do his work if you occasionally didn't if he occasionally didn't energize you to do it, could you? God is concerned about how straight we walk. I don't think God cares about our Sunday experience, but he's concerned about whether I do his will on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And there's a connection about how I worship him on Sunday and what I do during the week. And that's where the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul calls it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, comes in. It's these aspects of the fruit, the love and the joy and the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, are not just to be manifested when we meet with our brothers and sisters on Sunday, but every day, in every place, in every circumstance. Because then, as Paul says back in verse 16, we don't gratify the desires of our sinful nature because the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit's fruit seeks its desire in others as we love, are joyful, at peace and patient, practice patience and kindness and goodness and are faithful and gentle and are self-controlled. The Holy Spirit justifies us and he makes us right with God and acquits us of our sins against God. And he also sanctifies us. He makes us holy, sets us apart for God's purposes and glory. So the question we must ask is this. When does the Lord do this? When is it that he pours out his Holy Spirit on people to give them new life? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, that the Corinthians were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter says to those who have heard his message, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says that God saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself says in John chapter 3, verse 5, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. And then Paul again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, We were all baptized by one Spirit, into one body. These and other passages show that the Spirit is given to us when the believing, repentant person is baptized into Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit when we are saved. 
that moment of conversion when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. God lodges in our hearts and then grows with us as we grow in him. Sometimes up, sometimes down. We may have to wait for the Holy Spirit who lives within us to fill us and to possess us, which is different from indwelling. He wants to fill us, but he can only do it if we are totally committed to Jesus. We don't wait for the Holy Spirit. We wait on him in order that he may fill us with his power and make us effective witnesses for Christ, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. The big question that you need to ask for yourself this morning is, have you been regenerated by the Holy Spirit yet? Have you believed the gospel with a repentant heart and been baptized into Christ through the rebirth of the Holy Spirit? The good news is that we don't need to wait like the disciples had to. It is available to us right now. So don't wait anymore. God is calling you. Let's pray. Join with me as we recommit ourselves to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we have heard your word today and it has warmed our hearts and your Holy Spirit has opened our minds to understand it and it now makes sense to us. We need to be right with you, cleansed by the blood of your Son and filled with your Holy Spirit because without it we are just empty vessels lost forever away from your eternal love for us. So Father, through the power of Jesus' blood, we say we are sorry. Forgive us for our sinful lusts and desires, our self-worth and our pride, thinking that we alone are able. We open our hearts to your love that wipes away all fear and gives us a perfect love. Jesus, we place our lives in your hands. Lead us, guide us in your Father's truth. And Holy Spirit, enter into our lives and fill us with your power and strength, your peace and your love, to enable us to live for him who loves us. I give all that I am and have into your hands, dear Father. I am yours and you are mine. From this day forth, in the mighty and victorious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
hearts unguarded. And we confess we've walked away. Lord, take us back to where we started. Take us back to where we started. Where we first found. So now we leave this space of worship and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know that some things are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know that God is love. We know Christ's light endures and we know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the spaces in between all things, closest to us than our next breath binding us to each other until we meet again. Go in peace, and may the God of peace go with you. Amen. Let's join in singing now unto him. Now unto him who is able to keep, able to keep us from Before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now. God bless you all, and may you have a wonderful, spiritful day in Jesus Christ. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed.
Yeah. 